When you read through scripture, it's easy to assume that it's random stories, random history, random poetry, and random instructions. Because there are so many different people and so many different cultures, and the stories are so different from each other. But there is an overarching story. There is this grand story that once you understand it, it helps you make sense of all the other stories in scripture. And even more than that, it helps us make sense of our own lives because we are part of God's great story. And so we've been in this series about how to understand the great story of scripture. And this morning we're going to be in Genesis chapter 18. And that is not it. Hang on. Technology is wonderful when it works. All right, there we go. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. And then he went to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. Then he brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. And while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where's your wife, Sarah? They asked him. They're in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old. In case you're wondering, Abraham is 99, and Sarah is 89. Um, in case you think that's not possible, that's the point. <laughs> and uh, Sarah was past the age of childbearing, so Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? And then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. I just think that's so funny that God keeps that in Scripture. You know? That's the part I would have edited out. We have no idea how chaotic our lives would be without promises. We need promises in our lives. Making a promise is making a commitment. There are some things you are going to do or not do. There are some things you are going to give or not give. And without promises, we don't really know what to expect and we don't know how to prepare for the future. Promises are what keep our lives from being controlled by our emotions. Otherwise, we're just going to react to our emotions. Every one of us in this room, we've had a moment in time when we followed through on something, not because we felt like it. In fact, we did not feel like it at all, but because we had made a promise. Promises are what keep our life from sliding into chaos. We all know the power of forgiveness, and forgiveness is the solution for dealing with a painful past. Well, promises are the solution for dealing with an uncertain future. We need promises in our life. Both forgiveness and promise-making are essential to being human. The problem is, is that we see so few examples of people living up to that standard, but we do have one in God. 
A promise is the way you declare that you are more than just a product of your environment or just the influences that are around you, that, that you can keep your promise regardless of what things change around you. Making a promise is actually the exercise of your free will. When you make a promise, it's, it's evidence of your freedom, that you're not just controlled by everything and everyone else around you, but you can make a decision, you can make a promise. Your identity will not be determined by what happens to you. Your identity will be determined by the promises you keep and the promises you break. And promises are what keep us from wandering in our world. And if wandering sounds like freedom to you, you should know the Bible says that's the definition of being lost. Promises are the way we animate the force of our will. We activate it. We put our will into action. And a person who makes no promises, they just surrender to every other force in their life. They're only going to be able to do what their emotions tell them or whatever other influences there are around them. And you might hear someone that when they make promises, they put a lot of loopholes in them. You know, well, I will do this as long as, and then by the time they're done, you doubt they're going to do it at all. And you just feel like they've kind of set themselves up. So you don't really believe that that promise is going to come to pass. And then there are promises that are so outrageous on their claim that they're laughable. We just look at them and say, well, that couldn't be true. I mean, just watch some of the commercials and infomercials on television for four simple payments and 15 minutes a day. You can become a god. It will happen. And uh, you will have wonderful opportunities. And before the payments are done, you will have figured out that doesn't quite work. So here's the thing. When God makes promises to us, he does not have loopholes in them, and they are outrageous, and our tendency is to laugh. Why do we tend to laugh when God makes promises to us? And I'd like to talk just for a few minutes about that today. And the first reason is this, because we know our limitations. We know our limitations. Abraham is almost 100. Sarah is almost 90. It simply isn't possible. Sarah had been through menopause. And in case you're wondering, there weren't any special medications for Abraham. They didn't even have two bathtubs in the desert for them to sit in. There was no options available for them. Our observations seem obvious to us. And by the way, there are other people in our lives that will point out our limitations uh, to us. They'll, they'll come along as though they are a friend. We tell them something we would like to do or something we would like to try. And they'll put their, shoulder, their hand across their shoulder. And they will remind us of why that might not be such a good idea for us. And they want to spare us the disappointment, the embarrassment, and the pain. These little self-appointed rain clouds just looking for parades everywhere they go. All through scripture, people have felt the necessity of pointing out to God their own limitations. Moses pointed out to God when he was being asked to lead the nation of Israel out of bondage that he stuttered and so he didn't, wasn't qualified as a great leader. Isaiah said he was a person of unclean lips. Jeremiah said he was too young. Hosea had marriage problems. Jonah was prejudiced and a bigot. Peter denied Jesus not three times in his lifetime, three times in a single night. Paul persecuted the church. Timothy struggled with anxiety, and on and on and on it goes. So let me ask you, what do you remind God about when he prompts you to make a difference? What limitation do you call to his attention because you feel it disqualifies you from being used by him? God kept his promise. In Genesis 21, you can read about it. It says that the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he promised, and Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God promised him. And do you know what they called that son? Isaac. And do you know what Isaac means? Laughing. They were still laughing. Every time they saw that little boy, they just, they, they cracked up. Your limitations do not limit God. Your inabilities do not become God's disabilities. That's what we need to understand. Second reason that the promises of God seem laughable to us is because we know our failures. We know our failures. 
Abraham is not a perfect person. In fact, some of his more egregious failures are recorded for us in Scripture. It's one of the impressive things about Scripture. If the people who the stories were being told about were doing the writing, there's things they would leave out. Abraham had two occasions in his life in which he asked his wife to pretend that she was not married to him, but rather that she was his sister. The reason he did that is because Sarah was very attractive and he was worried that the powerful men around him might kill him in order to get her. This is an epic failure. He lies, he asks his wife to lie, and he puts his wife at risk to save his own skin. How many think that that constitutes an epic failure? And if your hand's not up, what do you think constitutes an epic failure? Abraham was critically aware of his own faults and his own failures. And here's the thing. We are aware of ours as well. We can try to justify them. We can try to rationalize them. But we can't escape the nagging truth. We're imperfect people. And the problem is not so much the things that we desire. That's not what usually gets us in trouble. What gets us in trouble is what we are willing to do to get the things that we desire. We wind up hurting those that we love. We're passive and apathetic when we should be doing something to make a difference. We bend the rules. We break the rules. And the same rules, by the way, that we expect other people to keep. In our world, there, how many have come to the realization there are still significant pockets of evil in our world? I don't know if these are the worst times our planet has ever faced, but these are serious times. And often we think that the reason the evil in our world thrives is because there are really bad people who impose their will on others. And what I will tell you is it's a lot darker than that. Um, a lot of times people allow evil people to thrive and gain power because we all suspect we might benefit from that new system. Or sometimes we're just afraid to stand up and speak up and oppose it. And our silence allows something to happen that never should have. We can become distracted when we get what we want. And it helps us to forget our faults and failures for a little while. But as soon as something, this is a fascinating thing in human psychology. As soon as something goes wrong in your life, as soon as you suffer loss, one of the first things you will think of is those faults and those failures and wonder if some kind of cosmic karma is being revisited on your house, if in some way you didn't cause this thing that's happening to you. Something painful happens in our lives and it just, we go right back, we remember freshly the faults and failures. In our world, we actually deplore those who are worse than us. There are crimes and things that occur that are offensive to us. But in a very strange way, we find comfort from knowing that there are people who are worse than us in our world. At least I'm not that bad. In an unhealthy way, we actually feel better about ourselves because there's someone who's worse than us. If you've noticed, we give a lot of media attention and a lot of social media attention to people who've committed some shocking acts. Why do we do that? You know, there's a family in our church that has been diligently helping for almost a year now, another family who have had unbelievable setbacks, and they've been helping them, and they've, this, this family has been homeless. They've literally been living in a hotel. I would name the hotel, but you would all know where it is, and I don't want to give them any credit or advertising, but it's a horrible place to live. And finally, yesterday, this family in our church helped that family move into their own apartment for the first time in months and months and months. And uh, what a different future there is available for them now. Why is that not on the news? Because that's not all that exciting. We focus on the horrible things. And by the way, when someone does a horrible thing, do you know what we do? We ask the neighbors of the person who did that horrible thing. Could you tell they were a horrible person? Were there any signs? And you know what the most terrifying thing is? A lot of times they just say, nope, I thought they were normal. Because we would all like to believe 
that we can spot the really bad people before they hurt us. That's not how it is in our world. We have these faults and we have these failures and finding someone who has more of them actually doesn't improve our situation. The more honest we are about ourselves, the more laughable it seems that God is able to keep his promises to us. When God says, I want to do this thing in your life, or I want to help you make this difference in your life, we just look at God and laugh. We say, you, don't, you must not be paying attention to all the bad stuff about me. God does not keep his promises to us because we are good. God keeps his promises to us because he is good. And God does not use us because we are better than someone else. God uses us because he loves us as much as anyone else. That's the reason that God uses us. So it's not our inability, or it's not our ability that will make a difference in our world. It's our trust in God's ability that helps us to make a difference in our world. Leads us to the last point. Why do we laugh when God makes promises to us? And it's because we often don't know our potential. We don't know our potential. I mean, we all have hopes. We all have dreams. There's a house we want. There's a spouse we want. We want to be happy. We want to be healthy. We, we want all of those things. And what surprises us is that God wants those things for us too, but so much more than that. See, God sees more than just the things that you might obtain. God sees what kind of influence you can be in your world. He sees that. If we actually trusted God to take care of us, it would change us and impact every single person we come in contact with. But it doesn't stop there. Not only does that grace influence the people we come in contact with, but because they're influenced, the people they come in contact with are influenced. If you would simply dare to trust the promises of God in your life, we cannot calculate all the people that would benefit from that simple action and that simple decision. God is the only one I know who can calculate that out. In fact, he tried to tell Abraham this. He called him outside and he said, just look at all the stars in the sky. Count them if you can. And of course, you can't count all the stars in the sky. And God tells Abraham, that's the number of descendants I'm going to give to you. You're going to be the father of many nations. You are going to be a blessing to the entire world. That's what he does in Genesis 15. That's where the original promise is made. And he pulls him outside. Abraham couldn't imagine the future that God had for him, but he did choose to trust God in that moment. And the Bible says that the moment Abraham trusted God, God counted it to him as righteousness. Now, this next part of the message it's a little bit indelicate. I just haven't figured out uh, a delicate way to say this. And I worked real hard, but we'll try. So Abraham is almost 100, and his wife is almost 90. And the baby that's going to be born is not going to be conceived by immaculate conception. There has to be a union between a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman. For people who think that trusting God is just pie-in-the-sky stuff, then you have no idea because trusting God is not just something you hope will happen. Trusting God is actually taking a step of faith so that it can happen. And so Abraham at nearly 100 and Sarah at nearly 90 come together, and the result is an answer to their hopes and their dreams and the promise of God. God, the future God hopes for you is not going to be imposed on you. He's not going to make you take this future against your will. Everything God does, he does by invitation. He offers the promise to you. We can decide whether to trust it and to believe it or not. He will call you to take steps of faith into places that you would rather avoid. But God knows what's possible if you're willing to trust him. God invites you to the future that he hopes for you because he knows what a difference it will make in your life as well as the lives of those around you. The very thoughts, I want you to think about this this morning. 
the very thoughts that you think are so impossible to you, the very thoughts that make you laugh out loud, could be the very things that God wants to do in your life if you will simply trust him. This is the story of God. This is what he does. He can take limited, faulty, broken people and make outrageous promises to them that only he can keep. And until you understand that that is how God operates with and deals with us, you will never understand the Bible. Every other religious system works on a cosmic karma concept. Every other deity and every other religion says this. If you can elevate yourself enough, then maybe I will do this for you. But in the economy of God, God says, I know you're limited and I know your failings and I am making a promise to you that I will keep on the authority of my character and my word, not on the authority of your character and your word. And until you understand that, this book will never make sense to you. All the stories will just seem a little bit disjointed. They'll raise more questions than they answer. If you don't believe that, you're just going to keep trying to prove to God how good you are instead of realizing that the promises of God are not about your goodness but about his. So let me ask you, if you trusted that God was with you, how would that influence the options that you are making in your life? What would you do differently if you actually trusted he was with you? What would you do differently if you actually trusted that he loved you? What would you do differently if you actually trusted that he has a fulfilling life for you? Because the moment you trust, that's when it's counted as righteousness. And that's what releases an entirely different future for you. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, you might be sitting here this morning and go, yeah, well, I feel like God did promise me some things and they haven't happened. So could I add one word to your statement? They haven't happened yet. But God is not done. And even though it seems options and opportunities are no longer possible, God specializes in doing the impossible. When God comes and he prompts you to take action, and he calls you to make decisions, he's telling you, he's committing himself, he's making a promise. I'll be with you every step of the way, and I will provide all that you need. And this isn't about your ability, and it isn't about your goodness. It's about what he wants to do through grace in our world. And that's available to every single person who dares to trust him. So if you're here this morning and you've not ever trusted him, I think I would put that challenge out before you today. Dare to trust a God who makes outrageous promises not because you are able and not because you are good, but because he knows what he would like to do in your life. And it is more wonderful than you can imagine. So Father, help us today. Help us trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me this morning?